Good afternoon. We are thrilled to be presenting a timely webinar today entitled Honoring the History of Juneteenth, One Family's Journey to Freedom. I'm Pamela Herndon, co-chair of the African American Affairs Committee of the Civil Rights and Social Justice Section. Today's webinar is sponsored by the American Bar Association Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, Diversity and Inclusion Center, and Coalition on Racial and Ethnic Justice. This panel is part of a series addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit the American Bar Association org crsj for updates on these programs. Today's journey and today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of, of our panelists by using the question and answer feature, not the chat function. So remember, it's the question and answer feature. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the program, and we will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your networks. Now, before I begin, you know what makes today so incredibly special? Both the House and the Senate have passed Juneteenth celebration holiday legislation. And you know what? It couldn't have happened on a better day than a day of our program. And before we begin, I'd like to welcome a few notable speakers to our program to make some special remarks. So it is my esteemed pleasure to present to you the president of the American Bar Association, a partner in Schnell and Wilmer. She is none other than the wonderful, the amazing Patricia Lee Repo. The floor is yours. Thank you, my goodness. What a lovely introduction. And thank you to all of you for being here for what I know is gonna be a terrific program. And thank you for joining the ABA and our section of civil rights and social justice to honor the history of Juneteenth. You know, lots of lawyers share a love of history. And sometimes I think more so than maybe other professions do. And I actually don't think that's either an accident or a coincidence. For lawyers to pursue justice, we must encourage people to tell their stories and to tell those stories truthfully. Stories are behind every witness's testimony, um, in between the lines of every contract or patent application or zoning request. And they of course are embedded in the motivation to fight for civil rights and human rights. Juneteenth itself is a story of freedom, of remembrance, of justice and injustice. The ABA may be the voice of America's lawyers, but it's programs like this that give voice to the stories that motivate us and propel us forward. We're grateful for this distinguished group of speakers who will help us tell stories which encourage us to emphasize, empathize with others and do better at pursuing justice for all. And we thank the section of civil rights and social justice once again for producing another outstanding program for our members and for all lawyers. The stories from our past must of course, inform our present and guide our future. In this moment of our nation's centuries long pursuit of a more perfect union. The story we are about to hear is maybe more important than ever. May this Juneteenth bring you inspiration and understanding about the law and the stories that animate it. Thank you. And who better to tell that story Thank you very, very much. Who better to tell that story than a federal civil rights lawyer? And with us today, we have the chair of the American Bar Association Civil Rights and Social Justice Section to tell you the story of Juneteenth because we know that there are so many people who may not know that story, but Angela J. Scott 
is going to tell that story for us right now. Attorney Scott, please take the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. And thank you so much, Trish, for those excellent remarks. As always, we appreciate your continued support of our section and our programming. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Angela, and I'm the chair of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice section. And on behalf of the section, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our June program today. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of history. As we know, President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation Proclamation technically should have freed the enslaved Black people in all territories when it was issued in 1863. Um, but unfortunately, that declaration was largely unenforceable, especially in locations that remained under Confederate control, including Texas and other states. On April 9th, 1865, that's the date the Confederate Army surrendered, and that should have immediately freed enslaved Black people in all of the states and territories. But we know now that it did not. And surprisingly, it's because no one bothered to tell enslaved people on plantations who had little to no contact with the rest of the world that they were free. It was not until Union troops arrived in Texas on June 19, 1865, and personally brought the news of freedom to black men, women, and children who had remained in bondage all of that time. It was not until then did slavery end. That date came to be known as Juneteenth in the African American community. And it has been symbolic of survival, of joy, of remembrance, of hope. It's affectionately known as our Independence Day. My family has celebrated Juneteenth for many years, but I'm so happy to know that Juneteenth is not just my history as a Black woman now. As Pamela stated earlier, as of today, Juneteenth will be recognized as a federal holiday and acknowledged as our history as Americans. And so the importance of recognizing our history, all of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, that cannot be understated. For me, the acknowledgement of Juneteenth gives me hope because it symbolizes the importance of recognizing truth. Recognizing Juneteenth in effect means that you must recognize the legacy of slavery and recognize that there may be more to do even when you think we are through. Like the ending of the Civil War and the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to mark the end of slavery and the promise of freedom, in truth, it did not. And to date, the promises of our great country, freedom, justice, equality, are not enjoyed by all. I am hopeful today because Juneteenth recognizes acknowledgement of that truth and acknowledgement of the remaining aspects of racial injustice still keep the descendants of slaves in bondage to this day. While we have come a long way, we still have far to go when it comes to eliminating racial injustice. Let me repeat that. Racial injustice still exists today in the form of health disparities, law enforcement and criminal justice, the racial wealth gap, unequal education opportunities, housing discrimination and more. And that has its roots in the enslavement of Black people. Um, but I'm hopeful because history has shown us both here in the United States and internationally that truth is the first step toward justice. Equality and justice will soon come. So let's continue to make it a priority and continue to seek education, knowledge, and truth about the racial injustice in this country. And let's commit to work to ending it together. Before we begin our program, I wanna make sure to just thank all of you for joining us today. And I wanna thank those who made this program possible, including our hardworking staff, all of our dynamic panelists, the SJ African-American Affairs Committee and its leadership, Pamela Herndon. I also wanna make sure I express my gratitude to our partner in this program, the ABA Diversity Center's Coalition on Racial and Ethnic Justice grateful for their co-sponsorship of this program, and we are especially grateful for the participation of their leader, Justice Adrian Nelson. We'll 
serve as today's moderator. Justice Nelson has a long history of leadership within the ABA, including service on the Commission of Disability Rights and a long stint in the House of Delegates. Most notably though, she serves as the first African-American woman justice on the Oregon Supreme Court. So we are delighted to have her with us today. With that though, we're gonna get started on this program. Um, before we begin, I just wanna introduce a short clip of the documentary, The Other Madisons, and we'll then proceed into a terrific program. Thank you. As I mentioned before, enslaved people were remarkable uh, human beings who had inner strength and a sense of balance and a sense of hope, and they had many talents and they contributed mightily to this country. But I think it's important for us to remember today that when slaves died, they didn't take those qualities to the grave with them. They pass them on to their descendants, including those of us alive today. So including me, including my daughter, Nicole, including my two grandchildren, Justice! one of whom is named Madison. We don't get it! Shut it down! If you don't get it! Shut it down! And so it would be 10 generations for Madison and Peter. But, but those qualities are still with them. And those qualities are still with other um, African Americans and, and the generations to come. As long as we remember our enslaved ancestors. And, and really that's why the, the Griot Griot tradition is so important. What a wonderful way to start our program. Uh, I am your moderator for today, Adrian Nelson, Chair of the ABA uh, Center on Diversity and Inclusion. And I'm so grateful that we're having this timely program. Uh, I want to remind people to put their questions in the Q&A and not the chat. Someone has already done that and I'll start answering that question in just a moment, there was a question, how many people are on? Well, we have over a thousand people on, but we could only have 500 on our Zoom and the other uh, 500 plus are able to watch us through YouTube. So that's the answer to that question. Today, we have some gifts is what I'm going to say. By having a discussion with a number of important people that are able to talk about history. And as has already been indicated, history is so important to all of us. I am a student of history because I want to learn my lessons the first time and how not have to repeat them. But also there's an acknowledgement that history has always not been told completely. And we're having a uh, additional aspect of our history told from a 30 year journey of uh, Dr. Betty Curse. She wrote the book, The Other Madisons, The Lost History of a President's Black Family. She has won a number of awards. She has spent over 30 years researching, documenting and confirming the history of her family as she fulfills the role as her right now, because she's eighth in line, eighth generation, family griot, the female griot. She has traced her roots back to West Africa, Ghana, and she documents the capture of her ancestor, Mandy, who was enslaved at Mont Montpelier. The griot and griots in Betty's families are the men and women who were the oral historians, storytellers, and historians of her family. The tradition of being a family griot in her family helped preserve the culture and values of the family. 
And when it was her time, when her mother tapped her and told her it was her time to become the family real, she confirmed the oral histories that have been handed down through the years and decided at her mother's uh, insistence, she told her, it would, she, she gave it to her early so that she could capture their stories in writing, resulting in the book, The Other Madisons, The Lost History of a President's Black Family. Now in this book, we're gonna talk a lot about it today. She documents her relationship to President James Madison and shares many of the details of how the family evolved. She tells us the of the words she remembers hearing her mother tell her, their family credo, always remember, you're a Madison. You come from African enslaved, African slaves and a president. Now, today we not only have Dr. Berta, Betty Pierce, but also Christian Coates, who was a historian at Montpellier at the time Dr. Kirst was conducting her research. And Eduardo Montez Bradley, who is the documentarian who lifted her words from the pages of her book for people to be able to visualize the story they were reading. For you, those of you who have not had an opportunity to watch the documentary, Eduardo's 38 minute documentary is on the ABA website. And if you have not seen it, you should take the time to view it in its in entirety. Also, if you haven't purchased the book, you need to purchase the book because it is important because they complement and enlarge the history of our country. Often enslaved people's history could not be documented. But because of Dr. Pierce's family history, we have a complete history of an enslaved family and the descendants from a president family. So the three of us are gonna have a conversation and we're gonna start and try and make it intimate, informative, exciting and quite frankly emotional because we need to connect our hearts and heads and as someone has already said our ABA president as well as chair of the section on civil rights and social justice it is important that we understand history and I'm going to add something to it the good the bad the ugly and everything in between and I think this discussion today is going to live up to that so if you don't mind, I'd like to treat this like we're having a chat around a table and the audience is being able to hear in and overhear what we're saying. So we're going to not use formal language. We're gonna call each other Betty Christian and Eduardo. And if you want me to call your nickname, cause I'm Southern, if you hadn't figured that out, I can do that too. But we're gonna get started and unpack the history of the other Madisons. So first question, I have to say, as I read the book and then I watched the documentary, I was struck by your tenacity as well as maybe I sensed a little hesitancy, like right now, not right now, but as you got further into it, I saw a transformation and sometimes it was light, sometimes it was heavy, but nonetheless, it was a transformation. So I'd like to start because your family credo had a transformation. It, it, it evolved over time. Let's talk about that. How did that evolve? And why? And what does it mean to you today? Well, the credo began shortly after the end of the war of 1812. Huh? President Madison and 
an enslaved cook on his plantation, who we know as Kareem, had a son. And that son uh, had a fond relationship with one of Dolly Madison's nieces, which didn't sit well with Dolly. So she sold that son, his, his name was Jim. And as Jim was being taken away, Corrine pleaded with him, always remember you're a Madison. And she said that because she believed that the name could help them find each other someday but they never saw each other again. But Jim remembered his mother's words and passed them on to his children and told them to tell their children that they were Madisons. After, um, actually after Juneteenth, when my family by then living in Texas learned that they were free, the name could now be more than just a tool to find torn away loved ones. Now it could be a source of inspiration. So my great, great grandfather told his eight sons that they are descendants of a president and to make the most of that legacy now that they have a chance. So he changed the legacy, the uh, credo, to always remember, you're a Madison, you come from a president. And they really did um, become inspired and you know, live up to that legacy. And it remained um, those words for two more generations. And then my own grandfather, my, my dear Gramps, who was born free, was proud that his father and grandfather and other enslaved ancestors had overcome enslavement. And so he added two important words, African slaves. So from then on, the credo has been, always remember, you're a Madison. You come from African slaves and a president. Do you think that you're going to uh, add anything to it? Or you, do you now feel that your family credo is complete? Um, I'm not going to add any words mm -hmm. to the credo, but I do want it to become, to continue to be a source of inspiration mm -hmm. to the descendants, including, you know, my grandchildren and future grandchildren. And um, the message of the book and is inherent in the credo is that enslaved people were remarkable human beings. And I think we have said this, but it, you know, they possess inner strength and a sense of hope by which they survived and many talents by which they contributed mightily. It's in the, it's in the uh, film. And, it, and so those of us alive today have those qualities. And I, you know, I want them to use those qualities to believe in themselves and to um, fulfill their dreams and to make contributions. Beautifully said, beautifully said. So I wanna take you to a moment in the book, as well as how it was somewhat captured in the documentary. You do tell your family's Juneteenth story. So I'd like you to talk about that as well as when you went to Mont Montpelier and participated in that Juneteenth celebration. Tell me how that, both of those felt, writing about that, understanding the history and actually seeing it become part of a, a, a landmark. My family's Juneteenth story is that when my great, great grandfather learned that they were now free. He took his wife, Elizabeth, to the edge of a cotton field and sat her, sat her on his knee and said, now only God is our master. Mm. And, he, and he also said, which really says a lot about um, 
slavery and what they had been through. Now I can really let myself love you and the boys because you're not going to be sold away from me. And then to his 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 sons, as as I said, he all I've already said this, but he reminded them that they were descendants of a president and to make the most of, of that legacy. Now, when I went to Montpelier, it was it was truly a celebration. There was a little bit of history, but there was a lot of rejoicing, just as those enslaved people generations ago had rejoiced. I just love that. I just kind of want to sit with that for a minute. It's just wonderful. Um, talk about when you first learned that you were a descendant of President Madison. And I understand you were, I read the book, so I don't want to, you know, take it away from anybody. Then I'm going to ask you some more questions. Can you hear me? I, I didn't hear the question. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, talk about when you first learned that you are a descendant of President Madison. I know oh, okay. it was at a particular I, time. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I, I just didn't hear that as a question. I thought you were reminiscing about the book. But I was about five years old. Um, and um, often when I would get kind of fidgety for whatever reason, often with my mom was had me prison, imprisoned by the sewing machine while she made fancy dresses for me, which meant sew a hem, try on the dress, pin a seam, try on the dress. Anyway, I would get fidgety and she would say, please try to remember, <laughs> you're a Madison. You descend from African slaves and a president. And so then she would tell me about the re relationship between um, James Madison and the in, enslaved cook. And back then, I just thought it was a way of getting me to behave. But as I, as I got older, I learned there's much, much more meaning uh, behind those words. How important has it been to your family to be a descendant of President Madison? And did it change for you? And if so, how? Well, I, my family um, is proud of our legacy. And um, my mother in particular was very proud of descending from President Madison. And my grandfather was really proud of descending from enslaved people. And I would say that I'm probably more proud of descending from enslaved people because even they, they just went through so much and never lost sight of, of their humanity. And so the, the way it changed for me over time is not only did I recognize that, but I also began to understand what was behind those words. Like, how did this come about? And in, implicit in those words that are in the credo is it, that, that there was rape. And, you know, I had to... Um, take that in and really be, begin to understand what my enslaved ancestors, particularly the women, um, had gone through. So they had, you know, had what could have been forced relationships. They had children that they could have had sold away, but yet they, they, they went on. They survived, they continued.
Yeah, go. Now I, I'm, I'm trying to mute and unmute so that I don't have this, you know, extra sound not doing it well. Now I've done it once, won't do it again. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Why do you think oral history is so important? And what do you think that the oral tradition provides that written history cannot? Oral history is important to all families because it, it really informs you about who your ancestors were, what kind of people they were, what kind of values and belief they had and how they shaped who, who you are. But it's importantly, especially important to African-American families because quite often that's all we had. So without eight generations of griots and griots in my family, I would not, not know that I'm a descendant of President Madison and his enslaved cook. So we're gonna talk about cooking later because you know, food is such an integral part of how we connect and particularly the celebrations of Juneteenth, you know, and you've already indicated that cooking is a part of your family history. But I was curious in this respect, and this is not a question you may not expect me to answer. So I'm gonna give you some time if you need to reflect on it. Do you feel that Mandy speaks to you today? And if so, what is she talking to, to, talking to you about? Oh, well, as, as I wrote the book, I became closer and closer to Mandy. Mm -hmm. To the point I, that I, it, it's not so much that I heard her voice, but I knew the words that she was giving me. I knew what she wanted me to know and what she wanted me to write and to pass down. And even today, sometimes I can hear her say, be fighting mad, you know? So when you have um, some justified anger, it's good, you know, it's good to be, to, to fight. Thank you. And before we bring in Christian and then Eduardo into the conversation, what do you hope readers will take away from your book and the, your, your history? It is my takeaway message and truly my life's purpose. So I, I really want um, descendants of slaves to embrace their slave ancestry and to recognize all the qualities that enslaved people had and to know that those qualities were passed down to them today so they can believe in themselves and like their slave ancestors, contribute to the country, fulfill their hope, have, you know, have a sense of hope and, and fulfill that. And for people who are, who don't have um, enslaved ancestors to really celebrate all the contributions that enslaved people and their descendants have made, not just to this country, but throughout the world. So I'm, I wanna bring in Christian to the conversation. And Christian, I'm gonna ask you, even though Betty can probably answer this because she probably has the memory very fresh in her mind too. How did the two of you meet? The two of us meet? Jeez, it's been so long, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think it was in, was it not until 20, the 2014? Uh, meeting. I think you met my wife before you met me, uh, because my wife was involved with the research gathering at the 2007 Descendants Engagement um, 
at Montpelier, but I wasn't. I was running kid programs back then. Uh, so I knew about you probably before you knew me, but you probably knew Amy. And then I think we got to know each other at the 2014 Descendants reunion when we looked at interpretation across Montpelier and tried to figure out how we could involve more African-American stories on the site. Is that your memory? What's your memory? You see, it seems longer, but... <laughs> Is that good or bad? <laughs> you know what? I think it's constant. You know, you can meet someone sometimes in a moment and it's been a short period of time, but you have a connection that is longstanding. So well, I, think well, I, knew, I knew Betty, I knew of Betty from the moment I started at Montpelier in 2000 because her, Betty, was it the first article in the Globe in the 90s? Oh, the, oh the, in the Boston Herald? Oh, maybe it was the Herald, yeah. Yeah, that was 1998. Right. So I, I knew who you were, as you know, in, in short order from the time I started at Montpelier. You were already a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that you just said you were doing kid programs, but I do believe that you are a historian and I understand you were one of many historians but I am curious and I put your other people in the audience are as well you talked about bringing in the descendants into the historical interpretation of Montpelier how did that happen <laughs> and why no and because and, and, I, I think the reason why I'm saying that is this is really key I mean, yesterday, today, yesterday there were hearings about Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. A year ago, lots and lots of people who were not enslaved descendants, descendants of enslaved people, knew nothing about Juneteenth. Yep. Now it's going to become a federal holiday. Right. It's a state holiday in my state, but it will be uh, recognized as such in 2020, but it was signed into to law this year, a few weeks ago. Now people have an opportunity, have a better understanding of a more complete story of history, Absolutely. which we want. Absolutely. When and how did the descendants story become a part of what you were doing? Well, it, it really is a fabulous story <clears throat> and it really hinges on two people at the very beginning, about 20 years ago, in uh, 2000, when Rebecca Gilmore Coleman, who is the great granddaughter of a man who was enslaved at Montpelier, uh, came to Montpelier uh, to uh, suggest that Montpelier restore her great grandfather's cabin that he built when he was emancipated uh, after the end of the Civil War. At that point in time, Montpelier had about 160 structures on the property that dated from the 1700s through the, uh, through the mid 20th century because it had been used as a private residence up until the 1980s. Uh, and so Montpelier uh, uh, decided to restore the, the cabin and to do archeological research into it. And at the same time, um, Rebecca Gilmore Coleman began to found the Orange County African American Historical Society uh, in Virginia. And one of the people that she did that with was Matt Reeves, who was the director of archeology span at Montpelier. And Matt had spent his doctoral work or done his doctoral work in Jamaica, uh, studying plantations that were long, you know, uh, long gone uh, up in the mountains, and he was really embedded in the community of people who were living up there. And he realized that the stories, you know, I don't know if he realized, but it, you know, it really struck him that the stories that he was learning, a lot of the history that he was learning and able to conduct, um, the success of his archaeological work was due to the memory on the oral tradition of the people who were still part of that community who had begun that community when they were enslaved 200 years ago. So Matt took that knowledge and, and brought it to Montpelier. And previously, most plantation museums looked at descendant groups 
as either uh, historical anomalies, right, that they wanted to study uh, just to see what the sort of like anthropological anomalies, how we can, what, what do all these people have in common and what can we glean from the fact that they were all descended from this place? Um, or they looked at them to just try to glean research information from them, family trees, and where did your family go after emancipation and uh, you know who begat who and all that stuff. Um, but Matt realized that what we really needed to do was to bring the descendant community into the museum to make them stakeholders in the museum and to involve them in the decision-making on site. Um, and that was not a popular concept 20 years ago. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't shouted down uh, and it was, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't latched onto. And so Matt was really the squeaky wheel at Montpelier. He's still there uh, and he's still the director of archeology. span uh, and, and it was really due to Matt's persistence that every year we did a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and we got more and more people involved. And with his partnership with Rebecca Gilmore Coleman, she really opened the door for Matt and for Montpelier to the African-American community in Orange County, which heretofore had only either been enslaved at Montpelier or they had been laborers uh, for the DuPont family who owned Montpelier through the 20th century. Uh, and so they were distrustful of Montpelier, even though now it was being run by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And this, this gained momentum and gained momentum and gained momentum until I'm happy to say in, in 2018, well, in 2017, we opened an exhibition uh, called The Mere Distinction of Color, which was groundbreaking in the field with won multiple museum awards and which centered the voice of the descendant community telling the story of the African-American experience at Montpelier. And so you'll hear, if you go to Montpelier today, you'll see a life-size picture of Betty and you'll hear her voice talking about her ancestors. And you'll see um, recordings of Betty that, uh, that Eduardo shot in that beautiful black and white photography with that great Southwest jacket that she has uh, and, and hear her answering sort of open-minded, uh, not open-minded, open-ended questions uh, about, about race and about you know, being a descendant and about history. Uh, and that, that exhibit led to the museum creating the rubric for best practices for engaging descendant communities in the interpretation of slavery at historic sites and museums, which is a really long title. Um, but to do that, to create that rubric, we were able to gather 50 people for a three-day meeting that included academics, museum people, uh, and descendants from plantations all across the South, all came together in a room for three days and brainstormed what, you know, what were the best practices for bringing descendants together and bringing them into a museum uh, so that they could become stakeholders in the decision-making process at, the, at a museum. And I just have to say, because this is so like in tune with Juneteenth, um, just yesterday, the Montpelier Board of Directors had a meeting with the Montpelier Descendant Committee uh, leadership, and they agreed to work in collaboration with the Montpelier Descendant Committee uh, to restructure their board of directors in a way that brought parity to the descendant co committee. Uh, and so that the descendant committee and the, the existing board would work together to select new board members as time goes on to create a, a brand new board that will have a, a, probably a much different focus. Yes, it will. And I'm wondering, is Betty on the board now? I, no, I'm not on the board, by, but I am on but the you probably, But you probably will meeting. be soon. You probably will be soon. I bet an invitation <laughs> is coming. <laughs> you know, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be, I mean, if, if, if I am invited, it's going to be uh, a lot of, of, of work. But um, this, the vote yesterday was really um, groundbreaking because it'll be the first uh, time that a descendant 
a group of descendants of a historic site and the board of a historic site or museum have um, true parity, mm -hmm. you know, equal, equal voices, equal power. And so it's gonna be a model for other historic sites and museums. So how does that make you feel that you were part of that change? I mean, because I hope you think you were part of that change because it seems to me that you are. Well, I, in more ways than you can imagine, I'm part of change. <laughs> yes. Um, I, you know, we worked hard together, the, the group, and, you know, I was right in the thick of it and, it, you know, felt part of, I felt like I was really part of something important. You were, you were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Christian, I so appreciate that history, the process, and actually the reflection that has happened as a result of wanting to go in a direction that no one else did, that vision. And uh, it's important. And, and, and talking about vision, I want to bring Eduardo in because Eduardo, you know, I, I, I really am impressed with creatives. I'm going to just put that out there. <laughs> and all of you are creatives to me, even though Christian said he's just a historian. That's the way he kind of kind of goes at it. But I think he's more than that. Eduardo, your documentary makes a strong, I believe necessary compliment to the book. And it enables the viewers to appreciate the history and how they're all inextricably connected and bound to each other. And I, I just loved how you were able to bring those narratives and highlight Betty in that beautiful coat, I might say, and really connect the history to the present. And, you know, I would love for you to talk to us about your process, but I also wanted to have you talk about how you envisioned how to bring the book and the stories to life. Uh, well, thank you so much for that introduction. And, um, and I, I, you use the word enable. And I do like to think of myself as an en enabler uh, often, uh, someone that finds the clues in a work or, or, or uh, in a literary work, a book, uh, or um, uh, on an artist, sculptor, or painter, or musician, or museums, uh, when they need to convey and enable others to understand what is it about. There's a uh, fiction and nonfiction have, particularly fiction work has, uh, especially uh, fictional works of history. And at many times, historical works of which we have no evidence. For example, right now, I'm working in a film about black fiddlers in the 17th mm -hmm. century and 18th century. And the problem is that we don't know what it sounded like. So if you don't know what it sounded like, how do you recreate that sound? And, and with the dark night of, of slavery in this nation, before uh, recording devices and photography came along, truly the only things that we have is oral tradition and uh, graphic uh, evidence, sometimes drawings uh, that can help us, uh, paintings, which are very valuable. We were able, we don't know what Jim, uh, um, uh, Betty's ancestor looked like, but Betty and I, and this is taking us into the process, Betty and I will look and I will bring to her uh, at odd, and we years uh, hours of the night 
uh, from one from from me in Virginia and G in, in in New Mexico works of art, and I go like, do you feel that this could be the man? Does he look like your family? Would this will this image help me tell the story? And she will say, no, definitely not that one, but yeah. I think this one might. And I'm like, why? I don't know. I feel a connection. Okay, fantastic. As long as I disclosed legally uh, on the documentary, non, non-factual image. It's an image that helps you humanize the concept that otherwise it's, it's very hard to do in a prose. Um, so we did the documentarians and me in particular because of my background in, 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 in academics and in law and in uh, and in history, um, I, I'm, I, I pull from all different sources. And I believe that at the end of the day, the only thing that I cannot master is the touch and the smell. Mm. But with the music, the effects, the textures on the film, the voices and the final mix, I can almost, almost see you in that Porsche and make you feel like that that banjo is being played in front of you. So my work is the work of a master of con- contextualization. Mm-hmm. Where does it take place? Who were they? I'm, I'm not in the details of the relationships, but yes, in the importance of making sure that the phenomenon of community is mm-hmm. understood. And here I hear a lot the word of nation and history. And I, I am beginning to understand in the last few years that nations are made of different communities. And that what that we should start by describing somewhat in the way that Tolstoy said, describe your village and you will be describing the universe of the world. I would like to say, describe your community and then you can describe the larger picture. And I think that that is exactly what Montpelier did Mm -hmm. by building a a, a transparent uh, prototype of what that community could have been to understand then from there what slavery was. But let, let us not kill ourselves. That is what slavery was in Virginia, not in Mississippi, not in Texas, not in Boston. So we need to work with, with, uh, with delicate instruments mm-hmm. in, during the creative process to make sure that we present, in, in my case, the case of the of the proponent of the writer of Betty Kirst uh, in 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 the most appropriate light. Mm-hmm. I love that. I mean, I was struck by Betty's um, reaction, taking it in when she realized she was walking in the footsteps of Mandy. And that was just a beautiful moment from the beginning of it to as a transition. And the way that you chose to shoot that Mm. was just so, so telling because I felt as if I could feel what Betty was feeling, which was what Mandy was feeling. And it was so important to understand. It gave you a knowing that we don't always have in our country about history. So to both of you, um, and Christian too, Betty, how did that feel in that moment? And Christian, I mean, and Eduardo, how did it feel for you to capture that? And um, did you understand what a, a moment that was? Or was it it just happened. You're asking me, right? Mm-hmm. And I would like Betty to 
Yeah, yeah, so that, if she liked, uh, mm -hmm. yes, ladies first. So, um, <laughs> how did it feel for you to be to walk on 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 the footsteps of? Mandy and that particular path, which no longer exists, by the way. Well, it was really, a, a, really an indescribable um, feeling because there are a lot of feelings there. So my ancestor was actually Corrine, Mandy's daughter, was an enslaved cook and there was a, a, a groove in the ground that connected this distant kitchen that we were talking about earlier with the back of the mansion and this groove in the ground was worn there by generations of enslaved cooks walking to and from um, the mansion to serve the Madisons. And so when I stepped into the groove, there was a really powerful connection as if Corrine and I were actually ah. walking together. And so it was positive in, in that it sort of completed an understanding of her and also of, of myself as, as her descendant. Um, but there was sort of a sadness to it the way because this groove in the ground was a tangible, uh, both tangible and symbolic tether of her enslavement. And furthermore, it was probably near there, that location where her son Jim was sold and as she stood helplessly and you know, when he was sent away. And, and when she started the credo. Hmm. Uh, I, I think the physical evidence um, is, is a great detonator and that it works as such for the, the people involved. Uh, for the, in this case would be um, for um, uh, Betty and, 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 and her ancestors is the way that I'm, an, I'm someone just observing. Uh, what I feel is, is Betty's transformation. What I can observe is how her demeanor, her face, her emotions begin to deliver the story in a different way. Um, these physical evidences, um, become part of the creative process in the way that she and I connect, but I'm not necessarily connecting with her experience. What I need to make sure is that when you see the film, when the audience sees the film, they understand the connection. Not necessarily that they can follow in the same footsteps, but that they will understand what is happening to Betty. In a way, I think the difference is for Betty is a therapeutical, therapeutical, yeah, therapeutical. Um, it's kind of like an ancestral psychoanalysis. It's a presence. It's a way of understanding. It's a way of reasoning and thinking. It's a trigger. For me, is an extraordinary um, possibility to reach deeper into my subject soul into Betty's heart. And, and I hate to say this, but the weaker my subject is, the better it is for me to come to what I want to. And when you have a wall in front of you, it's, it's, uh, it's almost impossible. Uh, so that's, what it, that's why a film well done, I believe, and my advice to everyone else is take your time. There is a pregnancy period. There is a romance period, a pregnancy period, and delivery. The the it's it's, it's, it's an homage to motherhood here. Uh, the romance is oh wow, let's make a movie. This is absolutely fantastic. This is a great story. The second one is I need to spend time with Betty. 
I need to get to know her. I need to, to know how she feels, to question her feelings. That's part of my role. Are you sure about this? And then to press forward and find the instances in which I kind of go, all right, I got it. To shoot a film is very easy. I put the camera and I do it. I mean, I don't have to do it. The camera does it. What I do is before I press the, my, put my finger on the on and off button and, 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 and then in my editing room, when I'm right here sitting in front of this computer trying to make sense of all these images, sounds, feelings, sweat, and tears. Eduardo, someone saved you because I was getting ready to challenge you. You said, um, you said I was a weak subject. And then someone saved you by saying, I believe Molly was her name. She said, vulnerability is a strength. <laughs> yeah, vulnerable is, but it's good to be vulnerable because we're rigid and, and we tend to, um, something, listen, uh, yesterday, I traveled 600 miles, 300 in the morning, 300 in the evening, just to spend some time, two hours at a cafe in Durham with a legendary uh, uh, black musician, his name I can't reveal, but uh, it's a very rare opportunity. And, um, and it's the third such trip that I do. And this is the first time that he passed me the sugar. I mean, it takes time to get rid of the, of the, um, of the mask mm. and to start relating to the other one. And it was a very difficult subject. We talked about Juneteenth, for example, and he being a, a serious militant and, 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 and uh, a civil rights advocate, he said, it's not for me to celebrate. I'm from North Carolina. That's a Texas celebration. Okay, I need to unpack this. Can you please explain it to me next time? Okay, good. So now I have to drive another 600 miles, <laughs> probably next weekend. Uh, hopefully he will pass me the sugar and, and the milk and, and we will be able to get deeper into this conversation and see what did he try to say? What did he mean by that? And it's always about, we don't always say what we mean. We don't always say what we think. And the problem is that once it's on the film, it's on the film. You can't skate that. So my job is to make sure that at the end of the day, Betty can look at the cell at herself on my film as if she would look at herself in the mirror. Mm. That's my job. Beautiful. Beautifully said. You know, we have a second clip, and I think that's a good time for us to show it. It is a second clip from the documentary, and it's going to be focused on Juneteenth, which is so apropos. My friend, I want to call your attention to the eight chapters of the gospel according to St. Luke and the 22nd verse. It came to pass on. The certain day that he went out into a ship with his disciples and said unto them, let us go over. Eight chapters of the gospel according to St. Luke and the 22nd verse. It came to pass on the certain day that he went out into a ship with his disciples and said unto them, let us go over on the other side of the lake. And they lunched forth, but as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm, a wind on the lake, and they were filled with water. Um, African Americans from the time of slavery through right now have made major contributions to, you know, to this country. And 
James Madison in particular, you know, without the luxuries that slave labor offered him, he would not have been able to go off to the College of New Jersey or whatever they called Princeton at that time and learned about the great political philosophers to formulate the ideas that are the basis for the United States Constitution. And without that Constitution, um, this nation would have failed. We got a glimpse of that jacket at the very end. <laughs> so, you know, this is a good time to go to the Q&A. I did see someone uh, put in some questions about family connection to South Carolina, but that needs to go into the Q&A so that I can ask it. Um, so, but I want to go um, kind of to bringing us full circle to now. So we have a question that I want to pose to whomever would like to ask. Do you think that if the murder of George Floyd had not been televised, that there would be a space of people and communities being interested in this enslaved history for Black people in the true struggles faced due to the purposeful or subliminal acceptance of structural barriers and the need of acceptance for all of the history of the United States. If I may. Go ahead. Yes, go right ahead. I think if it wasn't because of George Floyd, we would not have uh, Biden in the White House today. I think that that was extremely important that we brought awareness and clearness of where we stand. It was a very dangerous time in the history of this country. And but I do not necessarily think that the extraordinary power of slavery in this country would have been uh, stopped or propelled forward because of uh, Mr. Floyd's murder. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary uh, event, which I believe it fits more into the dialectics and the dynamics of the presidential elections than with the evolution of the internalization analysis and, and, and understanding of slavery. Uh, I think it's not related to that as much as it's related to practical politics today. Uh, have not been for the sacrifice, martyrdom, for the murder of George Floyd, most likely we would have been having this discussion under a second term of President Trump and probably Juneteenth would not have passed as a law in this, uh, in this nation as a, as a holiday, as a federal holiday, as we call it. That is my opinion. Mm. Anyone else? Well, I would just say that I think there's there's been a growing interest, and in, from the historical perspective, there's been a growing interest in the field of African American history uh, among people in the nation over the course of the last, you know, 30 years. But really, the way it's taken off in the last five has been pretty amazing. Um, and I think, speaking from the point of view of historical institutions, not just people being interested in, in history or people being interested in social justice more than they were before. I, you know, because of the pandemic, everybody's been closed and we don't know, I don't think, how historical institutions that interpret African-American history in an honest and sincere way are, you know, what they're going to see uh, in, the, in the aftermath. Um, when, when things can reopen. I, I'm very hopeful, but I will tell you honestly that we did an amazing job with the Mere Distinction of Color exhibition that opened in 2017, which no, you know, and nobody saw, well, let's not even go there, but um, you know, two, two months after we opened that exhibition 20 miles away, we had August 12th in Charlottesville, right? And that changed, that changed Central Virginia to this day 
Central Virginia is still reeling from that, and the tourism industry in Central Virginia is reeling from that. Charlottesville has become a household word in a way that's not good uh, across the world. And uh, and I think that I think that our historical institutions that have been trying to do the right thing have not yet um, seen any reward from that. Whether they should or not is another question. But I don't I don't think um, I, I don't think that's played out yet. I think that's fair. Um, so Betty, people are interested in some follow up history of your family. Um, they want to know if the De Madison descendants of slaves are involved with the other Madison descendants. Are the slave descendants recognized? And are there members of your family who have not wanted to associate or be related to the other side of the family is what I call. <laughs> the other side of the family. Yeah. Um, well, I have met members of the other side of the family. And some of them have been very welcoming and um, call me cousin. But others, I think, just wish I would go away and um, have certainly not been embracing. They've always had that Southern charm that you probably know a lot about. But, um, you know, they have, no, I think the best way to say it is they would like me to just go away. You know, and 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 not reveal you know this story. And members of um, my own family, I I think are you know resentful and and maybe angry um, about the history at Montpelier. But I don't know they they're happy that the story is out. They're happy about the book. Mm -hmm. Then they're happy about Eduardo's film. Mm -hmm. If I could just comment on that, there's, you know, I think there's, there's, there's a, people are probably fairly familiar with the sort of controversial reaction that happened uh, at, at a neighboring plantation to Montpelier at, at Mr. Jefferson's house when, uh, when the news came out about Jefferson and, and Sally Hemings. Um, but I think Montpelier took a very different reaction, and it's a very different story, too. Um, Montpelier has always been open to Betty's story. Uh, the staff have, have been, I think. Betty, I think you'd agree with that, right? Uh, I absolutely. Uh, the first time, from the first time I went there in 1992 to this very day, the staff has um, always been very supportive and, and really eager you know, to sort of fill in the gaps to complete the story. Yeah, but I think too, the difference is, there's another difference and that is that Madison had no white children that we are aware of, right? He didn't marry Dolly until he was 43 years old. So what, what happened in the, in the years in between, we don't know, uh, but he has no white children that anybody is aware of. So the, the Madison descendants that exist are descendants of siblings. He did have a number of siblings, all of whom had lots of kids. Um, so the, the, the other Madison descendants are descended through nieces and nephews. I have to say in my 20 years at Montpelier, I think I can count the number of Madison descendants that I met on one hand. Right, so there's just, there's not, and, and there is always a Madison family reunion at Montpelier, well, not always, but every, every couple of years they do a reunion. Um, but rarely does the staff get involved. Rarely is it a sort of a historical event, you know, where they're looking for research or tours. It's just sort of a, a family picnic where they get together. Uh, so there's, there's just a different level of involvement. Whereas the descendant community has been incredibly involved at Montpelier, right? And the, the descendant community uh, in large part, or not in large part, but there, there's a portion of the descendant community that still lives in and around 
Montpelier in in Orange County, whereas the the there are the Madison family does not, um, and so there's just been the the caretakers of the Montpelier of the story of the people who lived and were enslaved at Montpelier have been the descendant community, you know, and so they're the ones who have brought those stories to us, and you know, one one of the the most rewarding aspects of my career at Montpelier was the fact that they entrusted me to be the storyteller to take their stories and tell them to the American public. And I'm sure Eduardo feels that way too. It's I was, I, I was, uh, I was gonna, ability and trust. I was gonna compliment what you were just saying, uh, Christian. I think you just pointed out to a difference here that is, that is extraordinary, which has been lingering in, in my head for the last few weeks. And I, I mentioned something before between community and nation, right? And let's talk about community and individuals, because when you talk about the, the, white descendants that get together for the picnic and it's more like a family event, family event, vertical, verticalism, family, and it's linked to DNA and it's linked to alleged DNA because, you know, we don't know, not everybody has a test. But in the case of the African-American descendants from Montpelier, you talking about community. Yeah. about nation, tribe, community, family. They, that's, what, that's what they use the words, you know, cousins and brothers and sisters. It's, 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 a, it's a more intense experience and it's not individual, it's communal. And what is being passed on from generation to generation, and that's the role of the real, is the survival kit that came on the transatlantic experience. Hmm. That's well and said. that's why it's more powerful. And that's what is destined to, to stay. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. You can lose members of the family and the picnic is going to run thing. But the community is going to keep growing stronger. Well, it's great. I mean, you know, just look at the history, right? I mean, the, the Madison family sold Montpelier in 1844. And the people who are still there are the descendant community, you know? And they will remain there. And if not, they live around. And, like, and I, see, I see these all over the country. I'm on the road, you know this, I'm on the road every week. And, and I see it everywhere. It's, it's, it's a community-based experience, whether it is descendants of a plantation or black fiddlers. It's the same. So I know we're coming close to the end of our time. But I want to say on behalf of the audience and myself, thank you for sharing this very, very important journey in such an intimate way. And I'd also like to remind the audience that the documentary link, as well as the recording, as well as information on how to purchase the book will be sent to you no later than Monday, which is June 20. First, for those of you who wanted to know a date. But my final question to you before we transition is, are there additional plans? We've now understood that there's going to be a reconfiguration of the board. There is now the document, the, 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 the documentary that's out. We have a book that's out. What's next? For who? <laughs> Any, anyone who would like to answer. <laughs> Open-ended. Well, one, um, one of the many outcomes of this vote that happened yesterday will be working together on the memorialization project at, at Montpelier. And it, in, that will that will be very important, not only to Montpelier, but to other um, historical sites and, and museums who want to recognize the important roles that enslaved people have played um, to this country throughout its history. All right, it sounded like everyone has some additional plans who would like to share next. 
Uh, with well, Milosevic I, and Filia, I would, I would never. Uh, it's something like Christian said before. It's in we. It's in here. You never. You go in Montpellier, but you never get out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those. Uh, <laughs> that's the way you go in. It's, it's, it's hard. You get stuck with the story and the building of it, and the spirit and the people. You know, Matt Reeves and everyone else there is a fascinating uh, group of talented individuals. But uh, I, I will. I, I, I worked on the on the exhibit also, photographing like uh, Christian mentioned, and and now I have this parallel thing that we did with with Betty that is uh, very profound. And um, and I'll, I'll be around just like Chris is going to be around to tell the story of his twenty years there, and uh, and and Betty, I'm sure there's another book coming out there. And after you finish it, don't forget to call me. I will make it <laughs> Well, I want to write a children's picture book and um, a middle grade or young adult book about you know the same messages. Mm -hmm. All right, I, Chris, left I know you. Go ahead, Christian. I yeah, know you've been trying. I left Montpelier in uh, December of twenty. Or I guess it was it was January third of uh, of twenty twenty after nineteen years and seven months to come to Maine to run the First Amendment Museum, which is a nascent museum. It's a startup, it's a concept museum. Uh, and uh, for all of you lawyers out there who love the First Amendment, I urge you to go to firstamendmentmuseum.org and check us out. It's a great idea, it's a concept museum. We're looking for donors and champions and board members and advisors all the time. But I think you know one of the things that I can do here uh, is to use uh, African-American history as a vehicle to show the importance of the First Amendment, right? Because the First Amendment are the tools that we use to create the more perfect union or to bend the moral arc, as, as uh, Dr. King said, right? It's the same idea. And it's the First Amendment that has given this nation and all the people of this nation the ability to make us a better society. And that's what we're, that's what we're all trying to do. Wow. Well, I have to say, um, we are not going to get to all of the questions posed. I tried to collapse the ones I could, but that's the goal of a panel discussion. You want to educate, you want to get people interested, you want to have them looking for more so you can look for more by buying the book and watching the documentary. But now we're going to turn to our ABA president-elect, Reginald M. Turner, who's going to give us his remarks. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, it is always a privilege uh, to, to work with you, Justice Nelson. Uh, this has been such an engaging and educational conversation among really exceptional people. Uh, Betty, it, it has been enlightening to hear about your family's journey and for us to gain insight into the other Madisons. What a, what a rich legacy you have. Thank you very much for sharing your story with us. We're, we're also grateful to Christian and Eduardo for, for being here today and for their roles in, in bringing this history to life. Justice Nelson, uh, yeah, you and I have worked together for so many years uh, and, and I'm always appreciative of, of the way that you lead um, in the Bar Association and, uh, um, and I thank you for allowing me to be a part of, of this program. I'm very pleased that the history of Juneteenth was, was shared in, in, in detail uh, earlier in the program to provide context and, and to help uh, people who aren't really familiar with it understand why it is in reverence for, for, for so, so, so many. Um, it's got other names. It's, it's been regarded as Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, Liberation Day, and Emancipation Day. Uh, but what's really most important is that it, 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 this recognition um, to honor the end of slavery in the United States um, is considered to be the longest running African-American holiday. Uh, this is not the first time that the ABA has hosted a Juneteenth program, but this is the first year that the ABA observes Juneteenth as a holiday, which is a significant milestone within itself. And just yesterday, Congress passed a bill to make Juneteenth a federal holiday 
giving this pivotal day it's just due. And, and I, I, I know it's been noted already in this program that you know today, as we are in this program, um, the, the, the legislation passed by the Congress um, was signed by President Biden. And uh, um, we are moving forward with uh, making Juneteenth a national holiday for all Americans to understand our history and uh, to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation, which is one of the most important milestones in our nation's history. So I thank our panel yet again, uh, uh, Angela for her great leadership, uh, Pamela, the organizers and co-sponsors for this program, and a, a, a very special thank you to all of our viewers joining us today. May you carry with you the inspiration from this wonderful Juneteenth program. Thank you all very much. Thank you, President-elect Turner. Thank you very much. We're now going to turn our program, the remainder of our program over to Pamela Herndon, co-chair of the African American Affairs Committee of the ABA uh, Civil Rights and Social Justice Section. So thank, well, you very, thank you very much, uh, Justice Nelson. Thank you, uh, President-elect Turner for your insightful comments and for joining us here on the program today. And to the panelists, you know, there's just not enough ways to say thank you for being here and sharing the story with our audience. But I want to share with you one more item. You know, during the time of the Emancipation Proclamation and the years in which slaves were, were released from their slavery and captured, they were not having access to attorneys. And so one of the things that the African American Affairs Committee is doing in honor now of what is known as the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act we are having what's called Free Legal Answers Day on June 24th, where we are inviting African-Americans specifically and people from all over the country to put down and ask your questions and, and they will be answered through a program called Free Legal Answers. And it's gonna happen on June 24th from four until five o'clock PM. And we want to give back to the community as much as we possibly can as a part of our bigger program in celebrating Juneteenth. So again, thank you all for being with us. Thank you for participating in this program and watch for more programs coming from the civil rights and social justice section as we embrace social justice as it has never been embraced before. Have a good evening and have a great afternoon. And tomorrow, enjoy your holiday because it became effective immediately it didn't have to wait. So that, that holiday becomes effective right now. So because Saturday, June 19th is a Saturday, many people are off tomorrow, which is Friday, to celebrate that day. And thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.